Rump, Chapter 28, Grasping at Straws. Red fought against her bindings and gave a muffled scream beneath the gag she was until she was purple. The miller laughed. She's a feisty one, I'll say. Rather impolite. It took both Frederick and Bruno to catch her. They told me she was your only friend in the world. And, well, I suppose if you only have one friend, you might want to keep her. In one piece, that is. Frederick and Bruno laughed, and Red flailed and struggled against the ropes. Frederick and Bruno stopped laughing and stepped back. Even though she was bound, Red was like a mad beast that might break free at any moment. Boys, said the miller, sit our little friend free in the corner. Then go find a place to wash. You smell like swine. Frederick and Bruno shoved Red into the corner by the fireplace and then left. Now, said the miller, turning to me, do we have a bargain? Red made a muffled growl and shook her head behind the Oswald. What did she think I should do? I couldn't let her get hurt. The baby in my arms had been squirming and whimpering all this time, but suddenly it exploded into shrill wails. He sounded like a whole swarm of mad pixies. He's hungry. Let me have him, cried Opal, rushing toward me. But the miller stopped her. Not until he starts spinning. Spinning, spinning, spinning. Red and gold and Opal and the baby. I couldn't think with all the wailing. I have to think while I spin. Take him and feed him, I shouted to Opal and sat down at the spinning wheel. My hands shook as I picked up the straw. The spinning wheel vibrated when I put my foot on the treadle, like it knew something bad was happening. This sort of thing was magic. Haddle had warned me about. It was wrong. Twisted. I pushed the straw through, straw through the wheel and began to spin. Very wise, said Oswald. Now the king grows impatient. He is eager for his queen to display her talents once again. And as you can see, he's gathered straw all this time just for her to spin. You have three days. Three days, I asked. I can't finish this in three days. In three days, the king will return from, with his hunting party. The miller said, we have promised him results. Therefore, you will, pro you will promise to make the gold. Three days, family, and the bargain is off. He smiled malevolently at Red. She glared at him. Anger walled up in me, stronger than I'd ever felt it before. I wanted to punch him, punch him in his big red belly, and make him explode. Then the anger faded into despair. I was back where I started. Three days would not be the end. I would never stop spinning the straw into gold. Grant had tried to keep me from all of this, from the miller, his greed, from my own stupidity, but maybe there was nothing either of us could have done. The miller stepped forward with a length of rope and bound my legs and ankles to the spinning wheel. We wouldn't want you to get lost, he said. No, I couldn't be lost. My name was Rumple. I was trapped. One spool of gold. Red was sitting on the floor. She was dirtier than I'd ever seen her. She had scratches and cuts, and the dirt on her face was streaked as though she had been crying. Red crying. Strong, fierce, fearless red crying. I hated to imagine. Two spools of gold. Opal sat in a pile of straw feeding her baby. She was crying too. When she finished, the miller made her put Archie back in the basket next to me and told her to back away, to remind us both that he was mine, some grandfather. Three spools of gold. Four. The miller had gathered the gold as I spun it, draping it around his neck and waist and laughing all the while. Finally, after he was more tangled in gold than red was in rope, he slumped down and his beard began to nod. I was feeling hopeful. If he fell asleep, I could untie Red and we could make a run for it. But then I remembered Archie. Even if I could free myself, I would have to take the baby and Opal would probably start shrieking and that would be that. But I wanted to at least talk to Red. Opal, I said after the miller started snoring, ungag Red. Opal looked at me as if I had insulted her. I tried to sound more submissive and pleading. Your Highness, please take off Red's gag. No, she said sharply. I'm the queen and you don't give me orders. She's a mean creature. She's always pulled my hair when I was a girl. Evil, that's what she is. Red is evil. Red gave Opal a look that could certainly be called evil, and Opal cowered and then lashed out at me. And so are you, you little demon baby stealer. She began to wail again. Oh, make it stop. I couldn't think. I needed Red's brains right now. Mine were just too scrambled. Opal, your majesty, if you let her speak to me, I may be able to tell you a way that you can keep your baby. It was a hollow promise, but I knew it would work for now. Opal stopped crying and her eyes widened. My baby, you'll give him back? For good? I can tell you how it might be possible if you take off Red's gag. 
Opal obeyed, and as soon as she did, Red let out a slew of curses that I didn't think appropriate for infant ears. The baby didn't either, because he started crying, and the miller began to stir in his sleep. Quickly, Opal picked up Archie and rocked and soothed him, which soothed the sleeping miller as well. I had to admit, seeing Opal cuddle and whisper to her baby was very sweet. It made my heart pinch and swell all at once. I really didn't want to take her baby. Rump, you idiot, said Red in a harsh whisper. Why did you come back? I didn't want to, I said, still spinning the straw. Frederick and Bruno found me and kidnapped me, and I almost got away with until a gnome found me and announced the birth of Opal's baby. Then I had to come. Did you know that magic can force you to do something that you don't want to do? Magic will make you do anything you've bound yourself to, said Red. Why do you think witches don't like to get involved with anything? You're in a tangle, Rump. Since birth. Well... What do you, what about you? Unless I spin this gold, you're going to die. And what do you think they'll do with you? Make you Lord of the Pixies? Oh, please, Rump. You're the one who's going to die if you don't stop. I can't, Red. I can't. In a whisper, I told her that I had learned about my aunts and my mother and my name. Her eyes widened as I spoke. And when I finished, all she managed to say was, oh. The things I'd say hung in the air for a heavy moment. This was my destiny, Red. I don't have any choice. That's not true, Rump. You do have a choice. I started to feel irritated. I don't have a choice, Red, unless I choose to let the miller hurt you, maybe even kill you, or kill me. Do you want me to make that choice? No, Rump, that's not what I... The miller snorted and sat up abruptly, looking dazed and confused. What, where are, what are you? Red whispered frantically. Your name, Rump. There has to be more to it than that. Your mother wouldn't have done that. You think you know so much. There isn't more. My destiny is this. The miller came to his senses. He grabbed a handful of Red's hair, and she growled and struggled against him. Rump, this isn't your destiny. You're not... The miller fastened the gag over her mouth again and threw her against the pile of straw so forcefully that a heap fell over her head and buried her up to her chest. Oswald glowered at her, and she glowered back. Then he walked slowly over to me. I concentrated on spinning, hunched low as I fed the straw into the wheel. Whirr, whirr, whirr. Another spool. Another pile had formed at my feet. The miller's massive shadow fell over me. He bent down close, and I could smell his breath. It smelled like rotten meat and sour ale, worse than a troll's breath. Do something like that again, and I'll put your little friend in a haystack and set it on fire. His hand had came down across my face and knocked me back from the wheel. Straw flew everywhere, like thick golden rain. Get up. You will not stop until every last bit of straw is gold. He turned to Opal, who was clutching her baby, protecting him from her father's fury. You put that thing back in the basket. It doesn't belong to you. Opal obeyed. I obeyed. I spun in silence for many hours. The afternoon sun had burned through the window, making the spools of gold glow red. I had a good high stack, but I didn't think I had put a dent in the straw. I would have, I would have to spin through the night if I was to finish in three days, and one of the days was nearly gone. I was already exhausted. When the sun was low in the sky, Frederick and Bruno took me outside so that I could relieve myself of nature's call. They stood right by me, their hands on big knives at their waists, reminding me that I was trapped. At least the cold air revived me a little, and I could think more clearly. I forced my brain to not let me think about my destiny or myself. I thought of only getting Red out of this mess. Whatever problems I had, she didn't deserve to be tangled up in them. I would get her free, and then I'd deal with everything else. Back in the castle, the miller tied me to the wheel again and stood over me as I spun. Whenever I felt the bobbin, he quickly removed the skein and added it to the growing pile of gold. Opal had scooted near to Archie as she dared, looking back and forth between her father and me. She drew her legs up to her chest, wrapped her arms tightly in her shins, and rocked back and forth in rhythm to my spinning. She rocked so vigorously that the floor beds beneath her began to creak. By nighttime, the floorboards lifted each time she rocked back and forth, then cracked down as she came forward. Creak, snap, creak, snap. Red stared at me as I spun, a look of hard determination on her face. I shrugged helplessly, and she rolled her eyes and sank back into the straw. I didn't dare talk. My face still burned from the miller's hand, but questions tumbled around in my head. A thousand birds pecking at my brains. Red said I hadn't found all my name. But how did that help me? Even if it was true, I was no closer to finding out the rest. And besides, Rumple made sense. Trapped, trapped, trapped. 
Eventually, the miller fell asleep in a pile of straw, and the moment he did, Oval crept over to me with a desperate look in her eyes. You said you would tell me how I could keep my baby. Now tell me. I stared at her. I had nearly forgotten our agreement, but Opal had been waiting all this time for the miller to fall asleep so she could ask. Her eyes were red and puffy, and her face was wet with tears. Her chin trembled, and before I could say anything, she started crying again. Stop! Stop, Opal! I mean, your majesty. There is a way that you can keep your baby from... You can keep your baby. Now stop crying. She stopped crying and sighed with relief. Tell me, said Opal, as she wiped her nose with her sleeve. I racked my brain wildly. I looked at Red, but she just shook her head at me. We both know there was no way, but I had to tell Opal something, anything. I had to give her an impos impossible task. You must tell me my name, I said. Your name, she asked. Yes, my true name. All of it. If you guess my name before I'm done spinning this gold, you can keep your baby. But your name is Robert, she said. Or No, it's Butt. Frederick and Bruno always called you Butt. My name has never been Robert or Butt, I said impatiently. You have to guess my real name. And if I do, you'll give me back Archie? I nodded. I knew I was secure in this bargain. She would never let me, she would never guess my name. I didn't even have a real name, only a curse. I promise. Opal took a deep, shuddering breath. I can speak to the king's wise men and search all the name books. Whatever kept her busy and whale free. She went off looking much later, but my burden was still heavy, and my legs and my back already ached. I was in a sea of gold now, a filthy gold ocean. Later, Opal strode, strolled into the room with a list of names written on a long scroll. Is this your, is this your name Gasper or Melaquire? Balsar? Those are very rare names. It isn't one of those? I stared at her in disbelief. Rump, I said. My name has always started with Rump. But that isn't your own, your real name. It's only part of my name. She looked confused and stared down at her par parchment. Is it Nikan Buzadar? I stopped spinning and stared at her. Was she serious? My sympathy for Opal was fading with the thickness of her skull. That is not my name. Oh, was all she said, and she turned away, sighing at all the work she had wasted. Opal stared blankly at the parchment a bit longer, then stretched out and fell asleep in the straw, her arms reaching toward her sleeping baby. As soon as Opal fell asleep, the miller snorted awake, rubbed his eyes, and grinned at all the gold. He took a large sack and began filling it with gold. That's good, he said, looking at the gold, not me. Plenty for all. He stuffed the sack to the brim, then staggered out of the room with a bulging stack flung over his shoulder. The first day was gone, and though the pile of gold grew above my head, the straw seemed still seemed to loom like a mountain. A few pixies crawled through the cracks in the floorboards. All the gold and magic must have awakened them in their winter sleep. They danced and chirped around me and the spinning wheel for a minute, then nestled in the coils of gold and fell asleep. Buzzards, how I longed to join them.